here at USC. We have a long history of amazing graduates and program. Um, feel free to talk to me after the panel. I'm Bridget Mullins. I'm the brand new director of the program. And we also have several faculty members here, or a few faculty members here this evening. We have Nan Cohen here, and we have Sid Stiebel, who's there. And I think that's our faculty crew, unless I knew. Oh, she didn't know how to use the moderator. <laughs> so, um, so thank you for coming. Yes, we're thrilled to have this group of professionals and practitioners here, I'm walking some of them, but you'll see them in a moment. So I'm pleased to welcome Sandy Kleinman, Joel Gottler, Neil Tolkien, and Mark Van Arks. And there's more in the program about our panelists, and also Gina will be introducing them to you. Can you hear me all right? Um, so I also want to ask you to turn off your cell phone and voice makers before we start. And I want to thank and acknowledge Dean Susan Kamei, Ebony Cunningham, Natalie Taylor, Jackie Canadian, and Sarah Hammond, who are, are, have been uh, invaluable assistants tonight. Uh, so this evening's program, as I said, is an offering of MPW. This is a graduate level creative writing program. We offer um, uh, the study of poetry, nonfiction, fiction, playwriting, screenwriting, and TV writing. And you'll notice on your chairs tonight, there's a, there's a poster for Molly Peacock. She's reading next week at this time. And I know that you're probably here because you're interested in cinema. But there's a great deal of, of, of uh, poetry in cinema. And I hope you'll come out and you'll hear Molly Peacock read. There are a few of her poems there as well. So take a look at them. And um, she's an amazing poet and reader. So this evening, we're looking at the collective cultural object of the film and how novels and stories become objects of interest for adaptation. Thinking about this evening, I was reminded of one of my favorite short stories, which is The Swimmer by John Cheever. And there's a line in The Swimmer near the end where um, the narrator says, Bert Lancaster in the film, had done what he wanted. He had swum the county. But he was so stupefied with exhaustion that his victory seemed vague. And as you watch the film, you really see that line come to life at the end of the film. The same is true in the film version of James Joyce's The Dead, the John Houston version, as the snow falls all over Ireland. And so if you are a word person, as many of us here are this evening, um, then you get deeply struck by language and image, and seeing the transliteration is a fascination. But there are also practicalities, as we know, and we are fortunate to have as our moderator a presence who can navigate us through the ineffable, but also the tangible and the practical, and this is Dina Nahai, who organized this evening's panel. Um, towards the end of the discussion, time permitting, we will open up the floor for questions, so as you feel questions brewing, um, make a mental note of them. There'll be time. Gina Nahai is the author of four novels entitled Pride the Peacock, Moonlight on the Avenue of Faith, Sunday Silence, and most recently Caspian Rain. Her novels have been honored with many awards, and she has also been awarded with a, a wide leadership. Her novels have been translated into 18 languages, and they prove the sustenance of the imagination through stories, the most valid and vital sustenance of all. Uh, Gina's writings have also appeared in the LA Times, the Chicago Tribune, and many other periodicals. She holds a BA and a master's degree in international relations from UCLA, and she is a graduate of our program, the MPW here at USC. You can see this admixture of erudition and creativity in her work, as well as an exquisite empathy for her characters. The reviewer for the LA Times writes that Caspian Rain, quote, is a beautiful study in disappointment and loss and the conflict between duty and desire. Gina Nahai shows her characters just as they are, damaged. They are keenly aware of how they'd like to change their lives and how limited their options really are, end quote. As a teacher and presence at MPW, Gina Nahai has been limitless in her generosity and lucid in her instruction and example. We're very fortunate to have her on our faculty, and I'm going to turn the evening over to our moderator, Gina Nahai. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
so much, Bridget. And thank you to our panelists. Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I'm going to read the panelists' bios in part because I think you're going to get a kick out of it. In part also because you have no idea how much you can do in one your lifetime if you're like me. Uh, I condensed these. They would have taken all evening. This is the condensed version. Uh, and can we know which one is which? Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> to my immediate left is Neil Tolkien, who broke into the business with a teen comedy called License to Drive. You know the screen uh, That led to Richie Rich and then Jury Duty, which led to a re-evaluation of his writing, which led to his first adaptation, and Ethan Cannon's story called Palestine later retitled The Emperor's Club, which Universal is. At the moment, he has a project at Universal with Will Ferrell attached, another with Nick Cage, and 50 Cents attached. He recently adapted his New York Times, no, the New York Times bestseller, Blue Blood, The Cop Memoir, which was directed by Brett Radford for NBC, and is presently adapting Everybody Pays, an emotional non-fiction witness relocation story for Bethel Neal, a client of film and television producer Debbie Von Arts, who's sitting in the front row. If you want to go and give her your manuscripts, <laughs> hurry up. <laughs> Next to <clears throat> Neil is Sandy Feynman. Sandy is president of Entertainment Media Ventures, a company active in media investment and strategic advisory work, as well as motion picture and television production. He's also Chief Executive Officer of Reality Digital. In the worlds of film and television, Sandy's productions have included his work as executive producer of the first digital live action 3D feature film, Reality's Digital U2-3D. His role as co-executive producer on the CBS primetime series Rockery Homicide Division, and his work as a producer for the feature film The Aviator, directed by Martin Scorsese, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, for which Sandy was awarded a British Academy Award and Golden Globe Award. Prior to forming Entertainment Media Ventures, Sandy was a member of the senior management team at CAA. As a talent agent, he represented many major actors, directors, writers, and producers, including Danny DeVito, Robert De Niro, Robert Redford, Kevin Costner, Michael Mann. He also represented a significant group of film production companies, including Jersey Film, Wildwood, Tribeca, and Tate Productions. He serves on the board of the American Cinematheque, the Chief Executive Leadership Institute of the Yale School of Management, the Fulfillment Fund, and Whistling Woods International Institute for Film, Television, and Media Arts in Mumbai, India. He also serves as an advisor on entertainment and media to the World Economic Forum and its annual gathering in Davos, Switzerland. I swear if I know you've done all this, I would never have spoken to you, Sandy. And if you're actually into the whole bio, what it shows is you can't hold a job. <laughs> 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 you know, right to the doctors had the same job for his entire career. Next to Sandy is Joel Gottler, who is the founding partner of IPG. Now, I took this off the website. An agency with a mandate to improve the compensation and recognition of authors and to stand up for literary authors and values in the marketplace where they've often been underrepresented, aka ignored, aka left to die alone on the sidewalk in the cold and starving outside Sandy's offices in Burbank. <laughs> Joel started his career over 30 years ago at the William Morris Agency in New York and was made an agent upon signing superstar Mama Cass Elliott. He had a brief stunt as an executive assistant to the head of production at Universal. From there, he was the only partner to the legendary H.N. Swanson, who was the progenitor of the book-to-movie business in Hollywood. He was a partner with Michael Ovitz for three years, and he's been instrumental in publishing deals for best-selling authors such as Sue Grafton, Chris Anthony, Tim LaHaye, Sting, and Pete Rose. In addition, he exclusively represents film and television rights to 
James Ellroy, Edward uh, Warden and Michael Connolly, Pulitzer Prize winners Richard Russo, Frank McCourt, and James Lee Burke. He also represents a long list of literary estates, including John O'Hara, John Ball, and Stuhl, Andre Debus, James McCain, and Stanislaw Lennon. Coming to the end. Joe is also responsible for the underlying rights to such additional films as The Untouchables, Beetlejuice, Chocolat, In the Bedroom, The House of Sand and Fog, Dangerous Minds, Indecent Proposal, The Glo uh, Glory, LA Confidential, Black Dahlia, Zodiac, Starship Troopers, White Oleanders, Band of Brothers. His more recent packages include The Birthday Party by Stanley and Alfred sold to United Artists, and The Wolf of Wall Street by Jordan Belfort, sold to Warner Brothers with Martin Scorsese, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Terry Winter attached. And finally, next to Joe, is attorney Mark, Mark Conard, who is a member of the Ocean Picture Affairs Group at CAA in Los Angeles. He received his MBA from UCLA Anderson School of Management and his JD from the UCLA School of Law, where I was waitlisted twice and not never admitted, and therefore I became a writer I switched to. Um, <laughs> he started his career working as a private practice entertainment attorney and served as EVP and general counsel for two new media companies, E-Media and WHN, um, a Los Angeles-based business-to-business licensing industry exchange and provider of e-commerce solutions for over 60 major media brand holders, including ABC, NBC, Universal Fox Broadcasting, Paramount, Property Central, MTV, Playboy, TV Guide, and the 2002 Winter Olympics. Mark is married to producer Debbie Von Ox, who is sitting in the front row in a white sweater. <laughs> okay, so thank you for your patience with the bios, but come on, you know, you have to know. Um, but John will learn from Swans and representing dead authors. <laughs> very good. <laughs> well, maybe you will die and see what happens. Because the authors are great, the relatives are great. Exactly. <laughs> so, I was going to start, uh, Joe, <clears throat> with speaking of literary authors having been misrepresented and dying outside Sandy's offices and all that. Um, uh, let's say um, I'm a literary, I'm a Joe the Plumber of literary authors. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a book, and it's, uh, it's good, it's decent, and it's sold a few, few thousand copies, and uh, then probably forgotten, even by my mother. And uh, somehow it gets into your hands. What do you look for in a book? Oh, well, um... I'm a bloodhound when it comes to commercial ideas. And I look for uh, commercial ideas. I usually read the first few pages to see if the author can write. Then I look for characterization and plot. Stories are stories. There are not too many different stories. So those are the main things. Because I'm in an industry, I'm in a position of selling commercial movies, I look for commerciality. And I also look to make sure they've taken how much the thought and how much it costs to look for the table and set it flat. So commercial value, in other words, uh, literary books, that kind of thing, forget Yeah, it. I appreciate them, but um, there's not a big market for literary fiction yet now. Commercial market. Um, does, does the main character have to be American? Are those uh, rules, do those rules still apply? Um, well, most of the main characters usually are males because males open movies more than females open movies. Um, but it doesn't have to be um, uh, American. Yeah, Joel, the, the, the thing that, and, and Joel's being modest here, what, what his instinct does, which is probably hard to articulate in a way because I've, I've, I've seen him do it, is it's part of it is you know you have a commercial sense as to what's going to sell into a movie. Part of it is is it going to touch somebody, and largely is it going to touch an artist? Is it going to touch a financier that is motivated by an artist? Is it what is what what you know the thousand reasons something is made 
is in, indescribable. I mean, uh, I was sitting about eight months ago in uh, Dubai. And it was a nice evening. It was outside in a friend's house. And so it was a lovely evening in the Persian Gulf, a place like a Jewish guy from the Bronx could be. <laughs> and I was sitting with Abdul Hamid Juma, who runs media in Dubai. And he does not come from media, but well, you know, the Arab world is a fascinating world. They, they, storytelling is very much part of you know, everyone I met there. And it did not matter whether they were in finance or what they were doing. And, you know, I turned to him, I was across the and I said, you know, would you, would, would you show Kite Runner here on the cut? And he said, we did. He said it closed the film festival. Now, if someone literally just shut the film festival down. <laughs> no, 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 but, you know, it's, you know, something, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it was a lovely visit from that point of view because people actually respected the storytelling art in a culture that actually still had censorship like cinema paradiso. And, and he said, no, we showed it, and he said, uh, you know, it, it moved everyone. And when you think about it, and when I was at a studio, if someone came to you and said, hey, let's go make this movie, you'd go, you're out of your mind. Now, Sidney Kimmel made it. But the joke we used to tell is if someone came to you and said, look, uh, go make a movie about two early American communists, and, you know, the lead characters say they're, they're in love, but they kind of separate midway through the film, never find each other, and, you know, the, the lead character dies by eating a piece of dirty fruit in Baku. And that's, that's Reds. And, you know, you go, uh, who's, who's going to make certain stories? And books, you know, are the foundation of some of the most complex films that will be remembered. And whether it is studios, whether it's independent financiers, or as, as De Niro, I, I used to, you know, read scripts that I didn't think clients should make because I thought they were not commercial. And, you know, you talk to, you know, I, I, I got a big education over a period of years from Robert De Niro, and I said to Bob, I, one day I was reading a script that clearly was not commercial from a financial point of view. And I said, why do you want to do it? And he said, there's something in the part I've never played, and I want to play that part. So, again, the, the, the miracle of business is that there is no good reason anything should happen. There is no good reason that when I was seven years old walking through the Bronx, I saw a book called Crow Killer, not knowing that I would one day represent the guy who made Crow Killer into Jeremiah Johnson. Wow. So it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, you get, it's part of it is instinct. I mean, everyone up here except me, you know, basically either does themselves have or is surrounded by a diversity of instincts that, you know, leads them to decisions that may be right or wrong, but they are generally of passion. And that's what hopefully gets things made. Yeah, I, I sort of want to add to that because it made me realize why, why you choose a story to adapt. And when I did the Palestine, and that was the first adaptation I ever did, I read the story and I went, oh my God, an actor is going to die. An actor will die. The right actor will die and do it. And, and I think that's really what drives you. I mean, there's two things. Like you said, commercial, you always have to be commercial. If you're not, you're, you know, just sit there and nothing will make a difference. But if you can somehow get the two going together. I, I always feel like the actor is the way in. If you can get something into the passion and the heart of the actor. It's, it's well, but before you get to the actor, you have to get to the actor's agent's second assistant. To get it to yeah, the assistant, you have to get it to the agent. But right? I always feel that if you can write it, if you can write a great story with a great character, somehow or another, it's going to find its way. Does so it? For me, it happens. But I, I mean, you know, you, you, it does. Well, once it gets to people like this, it's, it's going to. Right? No, I mean, but the question is, how, how does it get? Sandy, would the kite runner have been made if it hadn't been a huge international bestseller? Would it have been made? Yeah, I mean, anybody have picked it up and said, let me make this film about this little Afghan servant boy. Well, before I turn it over to the largest and most powerful agency in the universe, <laughs> um, the, the answer to that is, and I, I can't, Joel can probably do this better, maybe you and Mark can as well. There was an old adage when I was at the studio that, you know, a true bestseller is harder, a great book is actually harder to turn into a great movie than sometimes finding a story that otherwise would have been overlooked. And, you know, again, I, I can't come up with the best examples of that, but I'll give you an example of one that comes to mind, which is, we know Stephen King is a very successful writer, but short stories like that which preceded Stand By Me, yeah. 
um, often would have been overlooked. Um, and Shawshank Redemption, I mean, again, I mean, Martin, you know, in, in the bedroom, I mean, th there are many things that are gems that are to be discovered. And probably, you know, global bestsellers get the attention, and maybe you remember them because they, as books were global bestsellers, but the number of films that actually had a literary spine and, and had a, a book or a short story behind it. I'll give you a good example. Is it took nine years and, and enormous brain damage to me to get A River Runs Through It made for Robert Redford. It was the first book I brought for Redford. He said, go buy it. It was not easy. Norman McLean was not a well-known author. It was a University of Chicago. It was, a, it was a known book, but it was a University of Chicago uh, professor, it, it was pursued by many because it was one of those underground titles that people love. And we had to make a deal with the family because Norman really did not feel his family story fictionalized very painful. And it was 90 pages of a novella. And I would encourage you all to read it in Young, Young Men and Fire um, because to me, the greatest education in terms of this conversation is to go find books that were hard to adapt and see the movies that came out of them. And that truly was, if, you know, there are many people who will never know that that was a book. They will never know Norman McLean's name. But, I mean, Mark, your literary department, as Joel's, you know, entire life, you know, you've spent, you know, they spend ages trying to find material, source material. It, it, agencies uh, may appear from the outside to have been monumental fortresses with moments that, that don't allow artists in under any circumstances, but the, the reality is that, that agents live for, they live and breathe looking for that material. They, they want to find that material more than, than like itself. That's their job, and the agency is, is designed to try to read as much material as possible. There's, there's legal implications to reading unsolicited material that just gets mailed to you, but, but if, if a good piece of material exists, marketplace anywhere, it will find its way to someone who will try to sell it, who, who, who will fall in love with it, try to sell it, become its champion. Everything doesn't get made, but you've already named 15 movies that, that if you wrote down the plots and show, show the studio executives, the major studios, they would reject them out of hand. Uh, House of Stanley Fog is not a bad idea. John Bond is like an obvious commercial best-selling James Bond kind of opening weekend, but that's a movie they got made. Movies get made. And, and, and Sandy's act absolutely right. You're selling to a very small audience at first. You're selling to the filmmakers and the artists who want to make it. And you, you need to only convince enough people to buy into the movie made. Um, and movies made for a price make money. Uh, a small movie made for a, a million, million and a half dollars has a hard time. It, it, it gets a theatrical release. And if you have the right cast in it, it will get a theatrical release. It has a hard time not making money. The movie will make money, and there's a lot of ancillary markets to, to sell it into, and over time it'll pay for itself. And, and so people will take gambles. There's always financiers, there's always, there's always agencies that will get behind stories that are not necessarily uh, you know, number one bestsellers or, or big opening weekend movies because they want to see the movies made. Uh, Joe, was, you were saying that 75% of films made in Hollywood are from based on books? Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact percentage, but it's a huge percentage. Isn't that amazing? Also, there's an interesting phenomenon um, that I call facts, which uh, is this, if I can describe it accurately. Angela's Ashes, one of the Pulitzer Prize, was on the New York Times in the first position for 17 weeks, and then I started to get offers from Mark's, uh, Mark's company on behalf of some of the clients. And I said to myself, well, why didn't they make me an offer the first week it was on the best sellers? <laughs> or the second, or the third, or the fourth, or the tenth? I don't get it. So what happens is a book, short story, non whatever it is, bounces. It bounces among everyone in the industry, and finally elements attached to it. Meryl Streep may like it, De Niro may like it, a director may like it, a writer may like it, and then something is sold. It's not where I take a property or Sandy or Mark or Neil and just send it to the first person and they say, oh, great, I'm so glad you're here, we'll buy it. It doesn't happen like that. His agency probably calls 
me more than anybody in town looking for material for their clients. And we but call them. For an adapt a screenplay that's been adapted. No, they call us asking for books, and I call them asking for talent. So if I get a book to his talent, I'm much better off just setting a book. Here, here's a, and I mean I can there's many many examples. They're not they're not usually you know, the, the book comes out in the bestseller list in that year the movie's announced. That happens on a fairly regular basis with a handful of books, but only the ones that are sort of the most obviously movies. Um, a lot of books bounce around for a long. time. People fall in love with you, they build a big building called Fallen. People tell their friends, I mean, I must have given away 50 copies of this is Bride over the years before <laughs> Rob Reiner like, seized on it and said, This is a movie. Um, there's, great, there's great books out there that we all love that we think will make good movies someday, and they will. But there are counter examples as well as you know, there are books that become hot instantly. And then, you know, it actually is either entourage or some other, you know, comedic view of Hollywood turns real. And, you know, the earliest example of that in my career, which you will remember, I don't think it ever got made, was Thy Neighbor's Wife, which I think United yeah, Artists right. had four and a half million dollars, which by today's standards would be about ten million dollars, or twelve million dollars. That was four and a half million dollars on a movie cost to go <laughs> into Thy Neighbor's Wife, and it never got made. And, you know, there are other books that have been, I remember when I was at MGM, uh, in the, when I was at MGM in the early, uh, you know, the early 80s, and we would go through, there were some books that had been bought by the guy whose name you will probably not know, named Sam Marks. Sam Marks showed up in Hollywood about 1932, and he went to see, through a family referral, a guy named Irving Falberg, and Irving Falberg, you know, you know, said, look, there's a, you know, we just canned our story editor, so you want to be that guy. And he became MGM story editor, which by today's standards has one meaning in those days standards it meant you had an unlimited budget to buy books and plays. And he he would we we still go over, we would still go over the books he had bought to see whether they were makeable. And in some of them, I'm trying to it will come to me later, the book that had I think eight screenplays written around it over a period of decades that was that still never been made. It's the one where, you know, they meet in the womb and then find each other in life and then they die and they start again. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean we read all the screenplays. But the fact that something is ninja, remember the ninja, the fox bought bought for David Brown for millions of dollars. Oh. I still have it there. And there are forty two different ninja movies out. So, you know, again, the fact that something, the counterexample is that there are things that are of the moment that may get made, they may not get made. Just remember, there are no rules. Things just happen. That's the difference between working for an engineering company or, you know, a widget company and something that deals in emotion and content and, you know, culture is that there are no rules when you're dealing in the human condition. There's a property that was published in 1933 called Mr. Popper's Penguins. Uh, I've sold that book four times in my career. <laughs> I'm about to sell it again. <laughs> it's big dope, and it still hasn't gotten through. Still trying to sell it for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Neil, let me ask you something. Is it easier to adapt, I'm not being facetious, seriously, is it easier to adapt a terrible book, like Message in a Bottle, or <laughs> an average book, or a really good book, well, I, like it's, what we like? <laughs> it's not like people have come to me over the years and book after book after book, but I can tell you that I was offered nights of rotating. Oh. And I, I just, I, just I, I, I knew it was going to get made, but I went, I can't do this. There's no way. There was nothing in it of anything that I could really, there was no... There That's was, by the same writer. Yeah, right. I mean, it's sort of ironic that you said that. So uh, it's hard to adapt a book like that. I mean, it's a paycheck for me more than anything, because there's just not a lot of depth, and there's not great twists and turns, and there's not great character moments. So those books... But then what I hear all the time is that a book that's complicated and there is emotional depth and this and that, that it doesn't lend itself well 
to, to a screenplay because it doesn't get right to the point and the, to the chase and all those things. Well, it's your job to sort of to figure out how to do that, I suppose. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's uh, hard to say. I mean, the book that I, that I just adapted now collapsed three different characters into one. And Which one's that? Everybody pays. Oh. You know, it was 25 years, and we made it 12 years, and there was no relationship between this character and that character. I mean, the relationships that you could make it work. I mean, it was a great challenge, but the character was so strong and the terms were so great that, and the message is so fantastic that it was worth doing. I mean, but I don't, I mean, what's a bad book? Like, well, like I mean, it would, it would be a book that you would say, it would be interesting. But some bad books make bad movies, like Towering Inferno, maybe. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but then some bad books make great movies, yeah. like The Godfather. Sometimes the movie ends up being better than the book, and, and, and I think elevates it. But you know, the, 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 the question you're asking, I think, is, is, is shouldn't be left alone. Because you're asking, are there things that are too complicated to adapt? And I think you touched on that. But, you know, we each have had our, you know, educations, whatever they are, whether it's in Hollywood or just in the creative process. One of the earliest uh, books that I was uh, in proximity to was, uh, was a film that I would encourage you all to go see, because I doubt any of you, however many of you have, which is the Malabar Beanfield War. And the book was, I don't know, 100 pages, it had a zillion stories in it, and, and I remember I, I had just joined CAA, and, and I was going to go see Redford, who was our largest client at the time, um, uh, in, in, in Santa Fe. And they were doing reshoots. And the studio had written this thing off as, if you can believe this, $17 million was considered an expensive film. And he was being judged more on the budget than on what it was. And there was a sense of death and despair about the movie. You know, and, and I read the screenplay on the plane. And I just thought, you know, in one of the miracles of young agenthood, they said, you know, go. And he said, come see me. And we were setting up his, uh, you know, what would become North Fork, his independent film company. And I read the, the screenplay on the plane down. And, you know, dozens of storylines had been turned into, you know, eight or ten storylines. And that was still too many. And the script was incredibly dense. And I was there, and I watched him craft what were dozens of storylines, the script had taken it down to a more manageable number of storylines, but still not a movie. And he actually, in the last moments of the editing of the film, turned what he basically took it down to three storylines. And he turned the story of a fight over water rights in New Mexico and a horrible first editing of the film into the story about how an old man and an angel save a town. And it's an absolutely beautiful film that was slaughtered because the studio did not have faith in it, did not market it, and the press lambasted him, post-ordinary people, on his next directing effort, which was a beautiful, almost European film. And, you, you know, again, there are no rules on books. I mean, you know, it's, it's, there are no rules on source material. You could say, how do you take this simple concept and turn it into something as rich as what a great mind can do? And I think as you go through whatever processes you're going through, and I assume most of you are here because you're in a writing program where you write, you know, if it, keep testing it out on people and see how it touches them. Because when someone says, I don't buy the elevator pitch, that doesn't mean it will not make a great book or a great movie. I want to go back to something I was asked originally, what do I look for? Mm -hmm. um, and I forgot about these the two most important things I look for. The voice. The book has to have a voice. It has to have some fresh voice that pops off the page. And, um, usually that happens more in narrative nonfiction. Um, that's very important to me. And also the twists. Does the story have enough twists and turns in it to make it interesting? Um, and I could cite a few examples, which I won't bore you with, but. Well, can you cite one oh, example of enough twists and twists? Yeah, there's a story. There's a story that came out of Chicago last year about a, uh, a dirty cop 
whose son was a drug dealer, and um, the, the authorities were chasing the son for 15 years, and they finally catch him. They put him in jail, and they say, you know, your father's a dirty cop, but he's still a cop, and we like you, so we're going to do you a favor. Here comes the first twist. We're going to send you from this jail to the jail up there in Oklahoma for the criminally insane. Okay? And there's a guy in that jail uh, called James Hall. He's a serial killer, but he's never confessed to it, okay? So you're going to go to that jail, and you're going to get the confession. And if you don't get it, you're going to be in jail for the rest of your life. If you do get it, we'll let you out. <coughs> First twist. Second twist, he's in jail. He meets, uh, he meets James Hall, and there's a whole series of fantastic things happen. And in the third act, the prison psychiatrist says, and he actually busts Hall and turns the information to the FBI who are ready to come in and, and map and, and put Hall away forever. But the prison psychiatrist says to him, who are you? Why are you in this jail? You know, who are you, really? And she said, you're going into solitary confinement. Yeah. So he tell us who you are. They put him in solitary confinement, and there's a prison for the, in the criminally insane. And now he's banging on the door saying, wait a minute, I'm, you know, you know, sh you know, I'm this guy, I'm undercover for the Chicago police. They say, sure you are. And they say, she's, she's a Princess Margaret, and he's the Pope, okay? And they keep him. I don't know him, but I have to And his handler, person who he was giving the information to to bring to the FBI was actually Mike Gitka, the football player's daughter, who was an FBI agent. And after seven weeks of in solitary confinement, they didn't hear from him. The FBI raided the prison and got him out and flew him back to Chicago and exonerated him. So, 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 so what? This is uh, Paramount, <coughs> they came, they paid over seven figures for this on one Page. I can see. Tough job, though. One page. That's all I had. One page. It had one twist, two twists, three twists, four twists, and that's Neil, why is that a tough and job? Bill Monahan, the Academy Award winning screenwriter that departed, attached himself to it. Okay, so. When you got, I look for twists. Twist. You know, <laughs> about the same time. <laughs> when you meet with studio executives, it's. Where's the turn? Yeah. What's the turn? Where's the turn? What's the card you're going to flip over? What are you going to flip a card over? Hitchcock is all by That's what you hear all the time. Where's the turn? Okay, what's the big surprise? Well, no, no, I need bigger spies. What's the character turn? I mean, that's that's exactly yeah. Where are the twists in this? And that's thing. what John John is a writer, because you sort of, oh, how am I going to get to that? How am I going to, how am I going to set you up thinking that that's not going to happen? And then twist it on you and turn it around, and then you just, and actors are just sort of, that's, Sort of directors now sort of look at that and it's, it's, that's that's great. I love that song for even fun. So what you're saying is it doesn't necessarily have to be that obvious in the book, but in the screenplay you you <coughs> yeah, yeah, I mean it depends what kind of screenplay you're writing. And I sort of tend to write commercial things. You know, you sort of get a sense for what people like and you need those twisty turns, you need those surprises. And, and certainly when you tell the story, you know, I, I read once in, a, in an interview with uh, a book, I think it was a Paul Schrader interview, and he said, he said, if you're telling someone a story and you see their eyes sort of tearing up, you know right away it's not going to work when you write it as a screenplay. Tearing up as if they're saying, no, 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 no and they said, in the prison, and here he is, he's got to look for a buddy. You have to throw him into solitary confinement. But how can you get out of solitary confinement if you can't? I mean, that's, and people go, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. It may not be an easy movie. Yeah, right? there's a, there are two or three other twists in that story yeah. that I haven't really talked about, but uh, those are the main twists. Here's another one, uh, which Universal thought. Um, a cat burglar is going to rob a brownstone in Chicago, and he robs the wrong house. He robbed the house of the head of the mafia. This is a true story in Chicago. And this guy's going to come after him and kill him. He's killed seven people on his way to getting this cat Rob, you know, like a paparazzi, goes into a hospital and takes a picture. Oops, he took the picture of the wrong guy. He shouldn't have taken it. That's an obvious twist that hooks you right away. John Gardner, you know, when he talks about writing a book, if you're not hooked in the first sentence or two, that's it. It's over. Ball game's over. So Sandy, when you when you're selling Robert Redford, yeah, you're doing uh, um, 
ordinary people. What was the book? Well, the first way, I got there. I, I got there after that, and, 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 and so did CAA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, that's a good question. But I'll tell you, just to be a contrarian on, on what's being discussed, um, I would I would challenge you all to go out and look for films where there really aren't those startling twists that have both succeeded and moved you. I mean, I know that that I can you know I try to conjure up some of them and. And, and uh, you know, you just sort of sit there and go, wait, no, you know, take Chariots of Fire. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, but Chariots of Fire is what's great. It's like, someone comes and says, like, let's go meet a movie with Mary Stars about the 1924 British Olympic race, you know, you know track team. Yeah, let's go. And one of them is like, you know, we won't run on Sunday. And then you got the Jewish guy who really had, and, you know, you guys should, let's do this. Yeah, let, wow, let's do this. I, and, you know, I actually had to sit at the, you know, this is in prehistory for me. I mean, we had a table at, excuse the expression, the only young people at the Friars Club in those days. And I sat next to a guy named John Boland, who was Laddie's driver. And, you know, we at MGM had passed on the film. And the Ladd Company picked it up. And it, of course, won like 11 Academy Awards. And every time it won one, John would stand on a chair and scream. But there, you know, there are always interesting character developments, but I, there are no radical shifts in, to me anyway, life is just in Chariots of Fire. But I think that, I mean, I don't, I don't remember that movie well enough, but I guarantee it's great character. This fabulous character twists. That's, yeah. that's what I mean. There's still going to be a great character turn, a betrayal, or something. Which doesn't have to be, you know, there's like, a, like, like a commercial twist. But still, there's a character <coughs> twist that. But there, there's generally conflict. There's, 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 you know. But that which touches people. I mean, I'll give you an example of, a, of another film that, you know, when you think about why films are great, um, David Beale is probably not the best person to quote on things. But <laughs> <laughs> never mind. <laughs> you have to be a certain <laughs> generation. Man. You're too young. No, to it's good. And, uh, it's, it's like the only time I'm too young. It's, like, it's funny now. It's like telling you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a piece. But he used to say that you have three opportunities to to succeed with a film. You know, one is in the script stage. Uh, another is while you're shooting it, and the third is when you're editing it. And the, the, and again, if you have a book and you have underlying material, you know, maybe that arc of, you know, the creative process of writing is extended backwards. But I remember we read Witness, and I tried to get my unnamed boss at the time to make Witness. I mean, Ed Feldman had it, Ed Feldman's not a, it's a wonderful producer whose name you may not know, and Ed is still credit as producer of the film. But if you read it, and I gave it to my boss, he said, you know, this is an episode of a TV police drama. And the truth of the matter is, it, 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 it was until it got into the hands of Peter Weir and Harrison Ford. And, you know, in the script, a line, they dance around the car. Mm -hmm. Or there's, how about the barn raising? Right. Mm -hmm. okay, the barn raising may be one of the most dramatic, emotional, telling scenes of that era of cinema. Because in, but when you think about the story that was told, it was not terribly complicated. The bad guy showed up at the end, and he shot him. <laughs> you know, that was it. It was over. But it was that journey you took into the Amish country, that love between Kelly McGillis and Harrison Ford, that special moments that happened all through the film. You know, films touch people differently. People walk out of them for different reasons, just as when you finish a book. You're going to walk away with a with a profound experience, and it can be very different in terms of the styles of the author and what they have to convey. Um, and different cultures have different responses as well. You know, the name of the rose, which was in Europe a phenomenally successful book, and the film made I think a hundred some odd million dollars outside the U.S. and it made. $2 million dollars in the U.S. And that was brilliant, so much. And it depends on your culture, your patience, and your and your sense of storytelling. That part of it came from whether you were familiar with the underlying material, part of it came from the pacing of films that was different in different parts of the world. 
And again, I'm not an expert in this, but the success and failure of any property is highly dependent on factors that are not always in the control <laughs> even of the studios or the filmmakers. Okay, so, so, Mark, I have a book and I want to... Um, but you do have a book. Four. I have four. <laughs> not that will never be me. That is so, not true. Trust me. Uh, really. You know what's terrible is every time you publish a book, people want to be nice to you, and they say, "Oh, you published a book. Is it going to be a film?" And you say, "No." And then they say, "Oh, well, maybe somebody will make it into a film." <laughs> and they say, if I wanted to make a film, I would write a screenplay, and then they think, "Oh, that's right." You know, sound great. Yeah, I should. Okay, but seriously, so you have a book and you want to make it into a book. What's the actual process? What's the best way to go about it? Is it better to get a screenplay written about it, uh, or adapted it, and then shop it around? Is it better just to do nothing and hope for the best? And how much can I get for it? Let's get to the heart of the question, right? Um. <laughs> and there, there's no formula for how to get a movie made out of anything. Um, but well, not anything, but a book, seriously. But yeah. if you, uh, no, it could be really any book. I mean, there's no, there's no, front, there's no, like, you can't follow these certain steps that expect it to have the result. Um, but the question of whether you write a screenplay or not really should depend on whether you are inspired to write a screenplay, whether you think you're capable of writing a screenplay. Um, if you, if, it, it, it never, couldn't hurt folks' chances of being adopted to have already gone the step of having a spec screenplay written well, based on the book that, that shows somebody how it's going to feel and look as a movie. Uh, it's, not, it's not a necessity. Uh, books have been sold on book proposals long before they've been written. Um, they've also been sold as, as finished screenplays. Uh, it's, it's, there's not a right path for that, except to say in the individual piece of material, what will help me get attention paid, what will help me get elements attached, what will help me get financing to get this movie made. Well, yeah, but look, you, 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 you I, I, I have a point of view on that. Uh, Please. Not, not to contradict Mark at all. I say to an author who wants to adapt their own book into a screenplay, I say, well, wait a minute, why don't you get paid for it? You want to write a screenplay, write a screenplay that's not based on your book. Because if they option your book for a movie, you get paid for the option, and if you're lucky to get a film, get the adaptation, you get paid for the script. So if you want to want to write something, don't write your book, you've already written that. Write something else. That's my own point of view. But you're asking two different questions, and it needs to be treated, I think, as two different questions, because you can get very confused. You're asking a commercial question, an economic question, and a practical question on the one hand, and then there's a creative question on the other. On the, the question you ask is basically how do you get it made? And you know the answer I always give to that is you figure out or the representative figures out what is hopefully the optimal moment of heat around a project and then lots of money comes. There's the other question which is What can you can you explain heat? You know, it's it's you know the mental the, the, the sense that people are competing for your project. Where can you get people to pay attention and compete? You can start a whispering campaign, all the dramatic things that you can think. So that's how maybe how you maximize your money. So when Mike Ovitz went out to sell Jurassic Park, you know, he was selling the literary history that preceded it and freaking big dinosaurs and Spielberg was going to buy it anyway and Michael Michael Crichton. Michael Crichton. Michael Crichton. And, and, and rightfully so. And, you know, Michael Crichton writes books that are highly commercial, and for the most part, they have historically turned it's into successful. movies by probably by intent. I mean, you'd have to ask Michael that question. There's a different question and a much more important question, which is who is the right person to turn something that is essentially. There are people who write for commercial value, and there are people who write because. Um, effectively, yeah, it's uh, it's the pain of their life and the knowledge of their life or stories that touch them. Yes. And they are, and, and they're not mutually exclusive, and people who write for commercial value may also have strong opinions about the creative elements that will be best to work on. 
the understanding and translation of their literary work into film. But Norman McLean's a good example. Here's a man on his deathbed, and one of, we will not say which actor went out to meet him because you know we, we don't know 100% all the details of it before Redford and tried to buy the book. And the story went that uh, Norman said, okay, let's go fishing. And uh, for those who haven't seen A River Runs Through It, it's a, a family story set against the tragedy of two brothers, their father who's a minister, and the metaphor used for the lives that they are evolving and working through uh, revolve around religion and religion and fly fishing. And until you read the book or see the movie, how it's all intertwined is, it's quite magical, poetic, and moving. But this is Norman's family story, and his brother did die a horrible death. And the actor went out, and they went fishing, and they went down to the river, and Norman said, you know, it's a good time now to put your fishing license in your hat. And the actor said, what fishing license? He said, you need a fishing license. At which point the actor said, you must be kidding. At which point Norman said, I will wait here for you, drive to town, take my truck, come back with a fishing license. And that was the end of the discussion as to whether that person should adapt a river runs through it. And sorry. You know, Redford uh, sent himself and Barbara Mulvey to work with him to interview Norman on his deathbed because much of what's in the film um, had to be drawn out of Norman to actually fill in the drama of the film. At one point, Norman, I was reading the transcripts of those interviews, and Norman uh, was saying in the interview transcript, um, I have not spoken about this since um, my youth. And he said, even today, it is almost too painful for me to talk about my brother. People like that don't necessarily need or want to maximize the economic value of the heat of the sale of the book. So, you know, it's, you know, we are in a sort of a religious season. It's in class tour tonight for those that care. Um, you know, it's Ecclesiastes. I mean, there's a time to every purpose under heaven, and each property has a different story that it itself will tell in its journey to the screen if it makes it there. Very true, but you guys, I have a book, and I want to know what to do with it. So you got to say something. You know. Play here. I'll oh, say one thing very important. Step? Don't, don't adapt. It would be my first response to any author who said they wanted to. Uh, you mean write don't write the screenplay? Don't write the screenplay. No, I'm not insisting to write the screenplay. I'm just asking, what do I do? But it's what if they're saying that there are there are substantial differences between writing fiction and writing screenplays. And the most obvious of which is that writing a screenplay is writing a visual story, and writing a novel allows you to go into the characters' hearts and minds and heads and history and, and, and move places that if you want to bring all that to the screen, you can have a very long and didactic and talking movie that nobody will want to see. So do I go to Joel's So first? do you yes. want to edit your own <laughs> screenplay of your own novel? No, I want him to my answer. Here's, here's my answer to the question. <laughs> You say, how do I get this book made into a movie? You bring it to me. I ask the same question. How do I get this made into a movie? Which is what basically what Sandy is saying. Who do I go to? How do I know who to go to? Okay? And should I go to these people? <laughs> so it's really not an easy question to who's hot at the moment. Wait a minute. So hot? if I know these people, I can just circumvent you and just. Well, it depends the level of your relationship. Yeah. I mean, it's a business of relationships. With, with publishing, you have a book, you have a manuscript, it's you find an agent. Different. I know. That's what I'm asking you. You want to see what you're asking is for us to be your agent, which is actually is no, no, we're going to do this right now. We're going to do this right now. Because we'll tell you how I like it too much. Okay. No, 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 but this is look. It, 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 Joel made this really and said, Mark, here's the bottom line. Because we, you know, while I have, you know, I have a general idea of your writings and a very profound affection for you. The advice here, you're a storyteller. The trick is, you know, you're like, you're like any artist in any medium. You know, you'll be an overnight success one day, and no one will look at the years that preceded it of 
honing your craft and telling your stories. So the best way to get your stories heard, I would say, are, are, are three ways. There's the personal way, which is the passion with which you lead your life and you talk because you write about a world that you come from, that other people, as we were talking at dinner, are only beginning to dip their toe into. I sent your book to the head of the studio. He did read it. He loved it. Whether he saw a movie in it or not, he learned something about Iranian culture. And he, he was very, you know, you autographed it to him. And uh, as you just were doing a lot of those that day. Uh, so, and, you know, so, so, you know, and, Ron, you know, these are people who love to read. The best thing to do is to give books to people who love to read, as opposed to people who hate to read but love to talk about reading, even though they hate to read. And, you know, I was explaining to, I got a 16 and 12 year old, I was explaining to them that not only can you get coverage, but there's coverage of coverage. And that sometimes the coverage is too long. And uh, you would send the coverage down and say, take seven pages and turn it into three or two. This is nuts, but this is Hollywood. Find people who love to read. Second thing you do is, and you do it well, as you did at Duckins, and you should do it all the time, is find audiences that want to hear the stories and tell the stories. Because out of those, someone will come who will either directly or indirectly relate something about the story to someone who then becomes intrigued and moved. And, and lastly, and most importantly, you just keep writing books. Because one day, all of a sudden, the timing will be right, and the entire life's work will be looked at in a new light because there is a time for Kite Runner. That time may not have been 10 years ago. It may be today. You know, each that which turns into art finds its moment in history, and to try to force it is often the same. Thanks, but on another another level of this is when I get a book, I like to look at the studios uh, in terms. I like to create careers at the studio level, not at the independent film level. So I say, what producers or directors or writers have these deals at the studios? Who will they buy a book for? So that's my first. Who am I going to send this book to? Well, this one has a deal, that one has a deal. So and then I have to figure out how to do that. Do I want to sell, send it exclusively to a studio of one of their people who have a deal on the lot, a producer, a director, a writer, who the studio will buy something for? Do I want to try to sell it to five, six different studios and try to get a bidding award done? Okay, it just depends. It really depends on each property, what's going on in town, who's hot, who's not hot, what the studios want to buy, which is very depressing these days, and whether, they colleagues, money, whether they have money, whether they don't have money, yeah, it's very, and that word tentpole movie, if I hear it again, I'm going to have a hammer. What movie? Tentpole. What's studios that? Studios want tentpole movies, they want. Four, five, and huge opening weekend, everybody goes. Yeah, that's what they want. Angelina Jolie, and sort of a superhero in your books. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell so, that to the next one. Uh, so, Neil, you, uh, you want to say something? You know, the circles that Joel rolls in are the, the highest, I mean, none of the highest levels why the big writers and writers try. <laughs> no, but basically, I mean, that's, that's no, likely, but, no, but that's know. kind of what it is. And, and for, for other you know, writers like myself, you know, who aren't going to be getting the uh, pick of the litter, you know, there's just sort of a magic, you know, I mean, the, the Palace Thief, I don't know if any of you have seen The Emperor's Club, mm. but it comes from a, a novella, which I was reading on the plane. I just, for the first time in my life, I just started writing one the notes in the margin, and sometimes it just happens like that. And it took my passion to love it, to convince two other people to, we, we option the book ourselves. Right, okay, so my next question. So you find this book and you like it, and what do you do? You contact the author or the agent? We, or? We, 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 we contacted the agent, and, and the agent made the deal, and I don't think anyone spoke to the author until I was finished with the screenplay, and I was scared to death. To speak to the writer? To give it to him and have him read it. Oh. 
And, you know, it was, Did you think you should talk to them before you Well, you've got to be careful because then you sort of develop a nice relationship and then you start to feel bad that you're going <laughs> to rip out the heart of one of his favorite characters. And so you, you know, you, you, you sort of use them the way you need to use them, but at some point you just have to cut bait and, and do what you're going to do and pray that when they get it, they like it, and if they don't like it, well, they wrote the novel, you're writing the movie, so there's sort of that magic. So you got it, you auction the book and then you, you write it on spec and then you go Yeah, I mean, I mean, you asked me why, I, you know, because I, you know, I had just written Jury Duty, which was a Polish short movie. And I was like, oh yeah, why did you change this? Well, because I wrote Jury Duty, which was a Polish short movie. You needed to cleanse his palate. And you happened to be at the... Wasn't the peak of his career, mm -hmm. and you know, and no matter what, if you write a Pauly Shore movie, I don't care how much money it makes, nobody thinks you can write. <laughs> but it was just sort of time to just sort of. I think the really important point to take that is that Ethan Payne didn't do something to get people yeah, that's to exactly. read that book. He picked it up in an airport because it looked interesting. He read it, and something happened, yeah. and that's the magic that happens to 99 percent. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That's exactly Alfred right. Hitchcock did most of his movies from books he bought in the airport. Really, he saw a paperback or bought the airport or books on the rack. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. I want to tell you one interesting anecdote. I was flipping through the trades last week, and I get to page three of Variety, and I see this heading, and I read it, and I said, "A movie's being produced from one of my books? <laughs> How could this be? I haven't sold the rights." <laughs> so what somebody did is they adapted the book on their own, they got a production company, they didn't realize the production company was going to make an announcement, they thought they could get the money from the production company, buy the book for me surreptitiously, and then work their machinations. That's got to be the best day of your yeah, life. It, 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 it didn't happen that way, and I was on the phone with the heads of the studio, and I said, you're kidding. Oh, this, this is going to cost you. So this is going to cost you. And, uh, <laughs> they had to wire me the money, and they had to give me two tickets to the premiere. <laughs> but the thing is, you don't want to kill that deal. No, so you don't want to kill it because then you're hurting your author, you're hurting yourself. You want to keep goodwill with the studio if you can, and somebody who's a genius. But There's, when they announce that the movie star is attached, you, your leverage changes. <laughs> and you can make a better. The answer to your question is so hard. It's really so hard. Right. Every single instance. Well, is writing hard. is hard too, but we do it. So, <laughs> uh, okay, so, you know, here another difficult question. Mark, don't tell me that it depends, because I know, but what kind of, like, uh, what's, a, what's a reasonable option, money? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, reasonable option. I mean, okay, not, right? not for what's his name. Uh, uh, look, it, it, it is absolutely a sliding scale based on a million factors. But the obvious ones are how free sold is the title. If it's a best selling novel, if millions of people will get it, it has a greater value, the option price is going to be higher. Sure, but, but Neil brings you this book you read yeah. on the plane. I, I, says, a book that's been out, let's say three, four, five years, it's been on the market, nobody's bought it to make it into a movie. Somebody falls in love with it, they come to their the agent and say, I'd like to option this book. The agent's going to be receptive to a lot of things. What he's going to look for is First of all, is, is this person capable of getting his movie made? Because he doesn't want to waste two years of the book's life sitting with somebody who's going to fumble around in the screenplay and never go anywhere with it eh, for very little money. On, on the other hand, if the person is happens to be Ross Perot that's coming and asking, you may think, I don't care what he does, but I'm going to get a million dollars up front. So it, it, it depends on the circumstances. But uh, if you're going, if you're a, 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 a new director or a young writer, and you're trying to acquire a piece of material that's been on the marketplace for a while, you can, and you're passionate, and you can convince the agent and maybe the author that you're the right person to adapt it, then they're going to be very receptive to giving you an option for a reasonable price. Okay, what's a reasonable price? A reasonable price can go from nothing to $5,000 to $10,000. That might be, that, that, that kind of For a year, two years, more? Give you a year, give you a year, and maybe you have to pay a little more, and then as soon as you get some traction, as soon as you get the project set up and somebody else starts paying the bills and starts paying the writer, then the, the author's going to expect more money at that stage. And it's all going to be against some purchase price that's going to be based on the size and scale of the movie. So a, a percentage of the budget of the movie is a, is a typical 
uh, determinative of what the purchase price would be. So maybe you say, I mean, I, 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 this is my life savings, I've scraped it together, I really only have $2,500, but can you give me a year to work on the screenplay and then I'll, I'll find $5,000 more to get a second year. And if the author says yes, then you go write your screenplay, you go try to sell it, if you sell the movie, the author is going to get paid, say, between 2 and 5% of the budget with a floor of maybe 100000 200000 and a ceiling of maybe five or 700000 so there's some limit to how big it can be, but the author knows that if the movie actually gets made, he's going to make some money. And it, so he's gambling, he's betting on it. You've got to be very, very thoughtful because people focus too much on the money alone. The option money? Any money. Any. And the, the option money, as Mark says, comes with a fairly elaborate economic calculation if the movie gets made. And that you figure out whether that's a proper trade. And then, as Mark and everyone has been touching on, are, is, is, is the right move going to get made if it gets made? But I also take a very dim view of how things happen. And I think you have to pay more attention to what happens when it all falls apart. And if somebody gives you $50,000, but you will never be in control of your property again, that's a bad trade. I mean, if you get $5,000 and a year later it's free and clear back to you because they wasted a year and screwed around with your property, and you can actually, de novo, start again without any kind of real problems, okay, you wasted a year. But if they gave you $50,000 and you never see it again because it's totally screwed up, then, then, totally then you've made a very, very, very bad deal on something you put your heart and soul into. Now, let's, let's look at an extreme example of someone who would like their property back, at least I believe they would, which is uh, my friend uh, uh, Paolo Coelho, the alchemist. So lots of people who try and make the alchemist, I've read various scripts on it, none of them are the film he wants made, as far as I understand. And I think, at least from what I've read in the paper, and I haven't talked about it, he's off to buy it back. This is a man who has sold one hundred million books. One hundred million books. And it's been translated into most languages than like any other language. Something like fifty languages. Eighty. Eighty. Mm -hmm. it's, like it's it's he, he has touched people the world over. He is an extremely lovely man. The man has brought philosophy. He can get the alchemist back. So you know you have to think about what happens if it works, and you have to think a lot about what happens if it doesn't work the way you want it to work. Stephen, this Payne. week I blew a deal with a major director on a property, major director that you guys handled, because they wouldn't give us a reversion. And the reversion is what Sandy's talking about. Yeah. You don't make my movie, I get the rights back, whether it's one year, two years, three years, four years down the road. Why without a reverse. Why wouldn't they? Yeah. I don't know. I, it's they a baffle. Yeah. Once they invest money and they pay purchase price, they like to control it forever. It's also the, it's also the schmuck factor. It's why <laughs> studios will not. Most studios. When I started the business, it was not unheard of to put a, a, a film in turnaround, which was we're not making it. Let me let you go make right. it. And then, of course, you lost your job if it turned into a hit. <laughs> so most studios today will not allow a property that either is in their library or that they have invested in uh, move to another studio um, un unless it's under extreme economic circumstances or there is some piece of talent that has been associated with it that has the absolute leverage to uh, you know, create the opportunity for someone to leave egg on their face. They'd rather leave it unmade than have a hit in somebody else's hands. The extreme, sorry, the extreme uh, end of what Sandy is saying about being careful who and how you sell a book is Stephen King, who takes no money, takes one dollar as an option fee, historically, for some of the best selling books and the most, and obviously one of the best adapted authors in history. He gets an enormous fee when he's made gets a lot of control over what film he has made. Like, has the ability to include the screenplay. Almost not very, very, very few authors can do that. Um, and so for him, it's all about controlling the material and less about the money and less and until it happens. And if it doesn't, he gets it back. I mean, he gets it back, he gets it back.
we, we gave Norman McLean the right to approve the screenplay of A River Runs Through It. And um, it's a low-budget film. So we gave him, and it went through three financiers to get it made. It was Carol going to get the page. Actually, that's not true. It was Jake, it was Jake Evans that finished it. And because uh, Carol Kuhn was gone by the time we got there, Jake got it over the finish line, and then Columbia picked it up. But I had to explain to his son-in-law, who was doing the negotiation as a film professor at the University of Chicago, who was actually a professor of English, uh, uh, that once the screenplay was approved, if you know, someone once described making a movie like the impossibility of making movies, like pushing it, humongous boulder up a hill, and it was next to impossible to get it to the top of the hill. But once production started, that boulder was rolling down the hill, and there was no way to stop it. And all you do is maybe slow it down a little, but it would crush everything in its path. And I, and I needed to explain that once the real money started to get spent beyond, and there was like $100,000 to adapt, writers kill minimum to adapt the screenplay, and Bill Broyles adapted the screenplay. And, uh, and, you know, once the real money started to get spent, then he'd actually have to trust that it was going to turn out okay, because we couldn't let him kill a movie in production. And it's a very complicated world. The ability to make those deals that are, that have those kinds of latitudes that Marx is describing have diminished with the increasing expense of everything associated with the film including the development screenplay. Do you guys I have to go questions? back to the original, original question you asked me again, because I just remember two See, you, you sort of changed me, and now you're being no, no, no. healed something. It's very important. When, what, 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 you run away what do I look day. for in a book? Uh, what do I look for in a property? One is conflict. There has to be conflict among the characters. And the second very most important thing is the bad guy, the antagonist, has to be the best character in the book. Really? Yeah, yeah. We, we, I used to represent an awful lot of action actors, and Jake Clean was maybe the most famous entertainment lawyer there is for action actors. Always would go around saying to his clients that don't do it unless the, the, the villain that you're fighting is insanely great and powerful, because the stronger he is, the greater you're going to look. Huh. What do you know? Okay, um, we have this roving microphone action going on. Um, you got to be filmed and put on the website and put on YouTube and all that, so try to sound intelligent. <laughs> you live to regret it. Um, okay, this gentleman has a very nice smile, so. <laughs> You're so shallow. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any benefit if you have a script? I have a screenplay I've worked. Can you stand up? I have a screenplay I've worked a number of years on that I've shot around some. It's been interesting. I'm now taking a step back and I'm writing the book. Is there any benefit to writing the book to a screenplay that you have, given that you can? Well, I could. I mean, I sell books to publishers, and I can tell you that there is a gold mine book business, more so than the script business. I can tell you that my authors make so much more money selling books to editors, they don't care about the screenplays. And it's good because you can get your copyright, and you, usually a book usually has a middle and a, a beginning, middle and an end. If you're lucky, you'll have an editor who will help you make it a nice self-contained unit. I personally, I love that. Anybody who comes to me, you know, I really like to represent authors what's in my dossier there. Screenplays, I've only sold two screenplays in my whole career. And, and if it succeeds as a book, you can build a great value. You now have, you now have that day when you go in to sell the screenplay. You have something else besides the screenplay to sell your pitch. Remember, most movies are made from books. And the great majority, I don't say most, a great majority. And they're, and they're also somewhat different disciplines. And, you know, look, I talk to people all the time, generally, who's chilled the market in the industry, and, you know, someday mine will, maybe. I hope not in some ways. And the, you know, the answer is, to anything, the more you stretch your creative abilities, the more you develop new, you know, 
voice for yourself, I think the better it's going to serve you in any application of that voice. And you may decide if you are comfortable in this adaptation that the next time you are moved to write something, that it may start as well. Can you tell the people in the kitchen to take it easy? Do you mind? Tell them to bring food. <laughs> make noise, bring something. Yeah, there is an answer, but wait. Okay, we're back to the question. Oh, my fabulous friend Lorraine, I have to favor my friends. <laughs> I found a wonderful book a few years ago that I thought was going to make a perfect screenplay. And the author had, without even knowing, she had done it, sold her rights to a publisher. So we approached the publisher and it's about running and left both of us in the dirt. Um, how would I do that differently another time? Just explain how she sold the rights to a publisher. No, she's getting the publisher. The film yeah, right. It's all okay. Right. Right. And you're saying when you say took off running, you mean he went and sold it, took your idea, sold it, and succeeded, but left you without any involvement? Right. He 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 went. Oh, this could be a movie, and he just took off and left mm -hmm. me. You mean the publisher did or the author? The publisher did. Yeah. What can you do? What can you do? Yeah. But yeah. in yeah. the future, if I were to do the same thing, if I would find a great the book, would I tell one of you guys? Well, personally, it would be soft. If you go to him with money or with, uh, you know, with something that you that you control the material, then and for motion pictures, then you're in the driver's seat. If you're afraid to even have that conversation because you think you're going to set off a light bulb and the guy's going to run and you get a better deal with somebody who's more experienced and pays more money than you can, then you have very few options. There's there's a line of cases about implied contract that say that if you come to somebody with a novel or original idea just in the context of the business feeling and with the understanding implicit that, that you're going to work it and you'll have to come to some sort of agreement in order to go forward, then you might actually have some recourse in that situation. I, I'm not really sure that that law is, 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 has ever proven to be something that, that's, that you can rely on. The facts have to be very specific. The fact that, that you already is in the business of representing the book and selling it to all the different marketplaces pretty much discounts that. I mean, uh, the, the, those cases come out of something called Dead Wilder, Wilder, where somebody came in to go to Wilder's office and said, hey, we should make a movie based on, you know, uh, it was Romeo and Juliet, set in a modern set. And, and, and he said, great, and went off and did it without the guy. And there was a, you know, the, the court said, no, you can't do that. That was a disclosure, and that was an implied contract. That's, I wouldn't be relying on that for your, for your livelihood. It's very difficult to prove. It's very difficult to, to win that argument. The best and only thing you can do is control the material, which you do by getting either a relationship or a, a contract. Mm -hmm. Check out who has the rights before you do anything. Yeah, I mean, you know something when you're dealing with guys, it's like the friends whose daughters want to be actresses. <laughs> and, you know, you guys like, oh, I'm a writer, so I'm not really smart. Well, the truth of the matter is, in, in the presence of opportunity, you do dumb things. Just don't do it. Just read the contracts before you sign them. And if someone says to you have to do something because it's industry practice, and if you don't, it's not going to move forward for you, and it defies your common sense, Go talk, go find, you know, your, you know, go, yeah, go get a second or third opinion from someone who's legitimate, and which you can all find, and, and, uh, and, and, and lose your head. And it's like, you know, when, you know, the casting agent says, show up in the motel, you know, not far from here, <laughs> and you're a 22 year old ingenue, you don't know. Because, like, logic will tell you that you're going to be on Nancy Grace. So don't do it. Don't be the literary equivalent of, you know, a CNN late night story. Uh, I know that most nonfiction books are sold by proposals. How likely is it to sell a novel the same way with a proposal? If so, what are you looking for in a proposal for a novel? It's tough. It's tough. Unless you have a track record, it's very tough. You could get away with it if you're really a terrific writer, you know, the chunk. 150 pages and an outline for it's tough. That's my answer, it's just tough. Not that it can't be done, it's just tough. By the way, my first agent was 
Is that right? Oh, and you're still alive. You know what Swanee would say to you, you know, in terms of writing, what should I write to sell? Say ransom notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah. she quit. She's a lady. You got that. <laughs> you, know, you know, we're going, I like his smile, because she's my friend to sex with him. This is like, oh, great for you. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, this is like, I'm going to say, I thought someone was going to say, why do you have four guys up here and no women in the, from the business? And the truth is, uh, because the women uh, wouldn't take my call. <laughs> uh, go ahead. No, you can only ask one, because then Angela has one. Actually, ask them both. We'll decide which is more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one is, uh, how does the entertainment industry get introduced to short stories in novellas? And then the second one is, how does the entertainment industry get introduced to short stories in Well, through the publish, <laughs> publishers, the New York literary agents, uh, you do. agents all over the world. You go to the, you know, you go to the uh, book soup and you pick up the Hudson Review and the Antioch Review and the Paris Review the and the Kenyon Review, the New York Times Book Review. The same way we all do. Yeah. And the, the state of the entertainment business, I think I'll leave the stage. <laughs> <laughs> But the entertainment business is a mess, but the economy is a mess, but traditionally it's a somewhat recession for business. I mean, people need entertainment when they're down and when times are hard. I don't think it's going to evaporate, although it's under a lot of pressure. It has a lot of its own problems related to the unions and, and, and vertical right. integration. And, and the kinds of things that Sandy's doing, right? Oh, yeah, Sandy's ruining well, it. Well, no, Sandy's ruining it. The bottom line is, I, 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 you know, in 1992, when there was this false convergence between CD-ROM and entertainment, which just didn't happen, you know, I, I started to do venture, and, and I will tell you, to me, this is the most exciting time for creators. I mean, you're, you're moving to this digital platform that's not yet formed. There's an explosion of creativity. If, if you want to get something seen, it gets seen. You got people harboring around, you know, digital water coolers, you know, the, you know, how many videos are we sent, and out of that comes exciting new stuff. And you can say, okay, you know, you know, it used to be a club, uh, and entertainment in its traditional form, like politics, like many things in life, is a miserable club to break into. There's no way you had to like find, you know, it's all of the jokes I found. The chauffeur read, the script gave it to, the maid gave it to, the wife gave it to, the agent gave it to the star. You know something? There's a thousand ways to get a great piece of creativity or someone's spark seen today. There's a democratization of media, and media will never be truly de democratic. But what there is is an ability to be filtered up and filtered through and okay, it's not perfect, but boy is it exciting, and we are all spending way too much time that we should be, you know, making a widget, you know, on our multiple platforms where we are exchanging ideas. And the positive thing is, and I don't see anybody in this room who is truly young enough to be of the generation, my kids' generations, they will be on an always-on digital platform. And bless their hearts, they're going to be smarter, and instead of learning things, they're going to learn how to ask questions. And our failure will to allow all of these new tools not to spark creativity. And, and in addition to being able to get noticed and, and to promote using those tools, it's also very rapidly becoming the distribution medium. And, and it's, we are, uh, you know, everybody always says five years about any technological development, but we are clearly within five years of of digital delivery to the home in a quality and a form that you can watch it and feel like you're in a movie theater. We are clearly within uh, five years of, of most of the theaters in the country being digital projection systems and pictures being able to be micro-distributed on, on a level where a, a movie can be made for very little money and get a return very quickly, get a theatrical release. Things are changing technologically that are a threat to a lot of the existing business, 
and but they're also an opportunity for anybody with their eyes open. Yeah, there are books that are going to become video games simultaneously with a book publication that will later become uh, digital downloaded on TV and then later will become feature films. And there's a million, you check the Writers Guild, uh, you check the literary marketplace, you check places where they have agents, emails, and managers listed, and you email these people. And if it's a responsible letter, somebody in one of these places will call you. Because we're as hungry to find something as you are to sell something. And you know, the, the beauty is creators are now if you know, creators are now in a dialogue with their audience. So they're creators and the people enable creators. And to allow communities will form around things that otherwise would have been undiscovered. There will be people who discover a book and they tell a friend and they tell a friend and they tell a friend and in the old days maybe ten friends would talk about a book and they'd all live in Akron. Now now they'll be all over the world. And if you're you know, if you're not on Facebook or MySpace, you know, we're corresponding, you know, in a very primitive way compared to what it will be about principally creative activity and all kinds of other wackiness with people that we would otherwise never be in touch with and out of that comes that which will be discovered much more profoundly than just walking through it. You know, the first thing that, that, that opened my eyes to this was that, that the fact that Trey Stone and Matt Parker did a little flash video called Jesus versus Santa Claus, and they threw it on the internet and it became South Park. I mean, the thing proliferated, got mail, emailed to everybody when no even had motives. And somehow that, that creates a market and, and a vision, and people respond to it, and it becomes one of the most popular TV series in history. Hi. Um, yeah, kind of along these lines, I, I see the you know, emerging media markets as a prime opportunity to kind of revolutionize independent film. And so that's kind of what I write, like writing. So what advice would you give to um, writers and filmmakers of my demographic to kind of relate to the old established production money in terms of bringing this new medium forward and making it progress and perhaps launching a new genre of cinema? What the meaning are you talking about? Well, like, you know, you have, like you were talking about the digital technology, and I see that as kind of a perfect opportunity for another independent film movement, kind of like yeah. what with video. Well, sure, it's been in the papers, the independents are going directly to the uh, internet. Uh, it, it's, it's an interesting time for independence. I, 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 two years ago, I would have said it's, it's the golden age of independent film, and, and every studio had a specialty division, and those are all being closed down and folded up into the main film divisions. It, there's, there is, however, more, has been more independent money until six weeks ago than ever before for, for independent film. It's, it's going to fluctuate over short windows, but it, it's definitely, a, that, that marketplace is real, and there's a, enough people pursuing it from the, with, with enough people with skills to make those movies, enough producers who understand how to raise money, enough money chasing movies. It, it, it's going to continue to be a good time for independent filmmakers. You have to just identify who, who's got the money and the capability at, at the moment in time when you're going out, because it changes overnight. To join the independent feature project by the place to start. You know, IFP helps keep tab on how those movies are <coughs> All of the young producers who want to make movies that are different, that aren't, well, you know, tip a typical studio, that aren't typical studio fair, are going to gravitate together and find ways to, to work together. There's a group called uh, Filmmakers Alliance. I think it's a great little group, and you'll, you'll meet like-minded people, and you'll find ways to get movies made and exhibited and distributed. You know, I, I give you two two thoughts, and I, I think you know. Because to me, the, the greatest change we're going through, other than distribution, and it's all enabled by digital technology, is go figure out how to make good stuff cheap. I mean, you know, I can walk into Bell Air Camera and buy a camera with a resolution that would have cost $50,000 today for $1,000. And you can buy editing software that you can do at home. And just as music was reduced to your living room, so is filmmaking. And people will cut you a lot of slack in terms of, you know, the smoothness of the professional delivery. By the way, the hallmark of a low-budget film in 1975 was the sound was awful. You can make a professional quality sound on a film today in your office. 
So go figure out how to make this stuff inexpensive. And the other thing which I would say is, and I, and I would highly encourage this, is do not worry about that which is commercial, although it should be in your mind that people want to see what you're doing. But particularly with independent film, go lead your life and go get some stories and not, you know, get out of Hollywood and go, you know, drive across the Baja or, you know, sleep your way across Mykonos or, you know, be in Africa and help with some, you know, people who need lots of help and come back with stories that haven't been told. And, you know, the good news is you can pack a camera today and everything you need to go tell those stories and you don't actually have, you can be Danny Boy. And you don't have to, you know, schlep around a $700,000 a day film crew and somehow something good that people will see will come out of it. I hate to break it up, you guys, but our director is looking at So... It's like midnight, isn't it? <laughs> we have a reception. We have a reception. You can accost everybody at the reception. But thank you guys so much. It was really nice.